Okay, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are here today for our second seminar in our uh, uh, dialogues in uh, onatology and, uh, and, and uh, behavioral ecology seminar series. Uh, this is the fourth year that we organize these uh, seminar series. And today um, we are happy to host uh, uh, Professor Diego Rubolini that will be talking to us about uh, between conflict and cooperation, social dynamics in Asian groups. So let me introduce to you our speaker today, if I can find my notes. And of course, I cannot. Just give me a second. Okay, here they are. So uh, Diego is currently an associate professor at the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policies of the University of Milan. Uh, he actually got his degree a few years ago, yeah. in 20, the Master of Science degree in 2000, uh, at the University of Pisa. Of Pisa. Yeah. And, uh, and then he got his uh, PhD in 2007, uh, again at the University of Pavia, and he got a PhD in experimental ecology and geobotany. Geobotan, interesting. Geobot, yeah. Um, yeah. His main research uh, spans from uh, ecology, mostly is on birds, and uh, the, he has uh, a few topics that are his, uh, his um, let's say, uh, strengths, and it's, it's about ecology and evolution of avian movements and migration, early maternal effects mediated by egg traits in birds, Ecology and evolution of color polymorphism in birds, habitat selection in avian species, and impact of human activities on birds. And finally, there is something that is not a bird that is uh, the behavioral ecology of freshwater crayfish. So he, ha he is a very productive researcher with uh, more than 200 uh, uh, published paper, uh, index published paper, and uh, very interesting. Interestingly, 65% uh, of them are in the top quartile of quality within their categories. So, without further ado, I am happy to give the podium to Diego for his talk. So, thanks a lot, Alessandro. It's a pleasure to be here in present, especially. It was a yeah, long time when we could meet, so being here is a really pleasure for me as well. And hope it will be also for you. Um, so uh, today I will uh, introduce you to this interesting topic, which is how uh, birds, especially nestling birds, interact within the brood, where they hatch and where they have to grow before fledging. Okay. So uh, and well, as you, as you can see from the um, from the title, uh, it, we start with conflict and we have incorporated. So there is kind of a huge, let's say, uh, continuum of uh, interactions between uh, nestlings in, uh, in area groups. The most, let's say, striking patterns regards conflict, as you will see, they can go from to siblings, even to siblings, so they can even each other that's in the group. But we can also, have, we have also very interesting examples of, of coloring. So this is the topic of today's talk. Uh, this is not really something I've been in recent years, in fact, as Alessandro told you, this is not one of my, let's say, core topics, but still something I've been very interested in and I've been doing quite a lot of work, especially in past years, and especially in collaboration with my colleague, now a researcher at Milano, Andrea Romano. He is maybe the leading, old, most, most of the papers I will show today, my paper on this topic, are, are led by, uh, by Andrea, and I've been involved in planning and analyzing and writing papers, but he has been the, the leading author. So it's basically, basically I'm kind of stealing <laughs> the topic from, from Andrea's work. Anyway, um, so uh, of course, uh, uh, we start with conflicts because conflicts are really everywhere. In uh, there are some examples here, very, very uh, fun examples, territories, birds 
animals in general, uh, most many animals are territorial and they fight against each other for, for, defining, the, for defending boundaries of territories. And, and this can be, let's say, uh, hard boundaries. Even when we don't see them, there, are, there can be very hard boundaries which cannot be crossed by individuals, otherwise, the fight uh, starts and, and the uh, animals can fight for this. Of course, there is, there is a, a conflicts for access to mates. Uh, there are uh, uh, especially mate, mate competition among uh, males or among females, depending on the mating system. So, uh, or there are conflicts between, between conflicts of interest, especially between partners. Sometimes the males uh, want males to do more than what they may do, and obviously the opposite can be the case, depending on the mating system. And so, this conflict also arises between partners. So, of course, there is conflict between parent and offspring. This is something which everybody like me has a uh, child in their teenage. No, very well. <laughs> I'm struggling a lot with, with uh, you know, uh, dealing with them, and uh, and of course we come to the conflicts we are mostly uh, talking about today. That is conflict between siblings. Right? Uh, well, just to uh, the, the the common let's say wisdom about uh, uh, conflict between siblings is quite widespread, and this is, there is this Italian adage which I think everybody will understand. Even if it's not uh, Italian. Parenti serpenti, cugini sassini, fratelli coltelli, which was also the, let's say, the, the, the target of a very bad movie of the 80s or so, uh, which, is the, which I put it here today. So this is the, the, the core argument of today. Um, we are uh, studying conflicts and interactions in general, interactions in general, in avian rooms. Well, uh, why? So first, before going a bit more into the details of this, uh, this, uh, this topic, uh, let me introduce briefly why the Evan Broom is a good model for studying the social dynamics, uh, which can go again, from, from hard conflicts to human cooperation. First of all, Evan Broom stems from clutches, and clutches can be highly variable. Okay, so we have this is a, a, a nice analysis of uh, the. Uh, the um,
Attiva audio, attiva Da questo okay. posto. Va bene. A questo punto devi condividere. condividere. Sì, devi condividere. <ride> un problema no ok eh, ripartiamo uh, yes so we can start again is connect the, is the screen share yes can you see the screen uh, yes so it's okay we can go on yes everybody can Hopefully. hear me adesso tutto ok yeah. Okay, so uh, as we said, this variation in the number of offspring birds can produce and have to say they have to grow in the same clutch, in the same brood, uh, uh, set the scene for let's say interactions to, to happen to occur, especially in artificial species. Uh, just a you know, quick recap for those which are not familiar with birds, maybe most of you are, but I don't know. Uh, th these are these are the key phases of, of uh, an avian brood. Uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, egg, um, egg laying and then the incubation for uh, uh, some amount of time, which can be very highly variable between species, but in pastor it's typically 50 days, uh, where the female or male can brew the eggs and then the, the embryo develops. Then the, uh, the chick hatch, uh, the chicks hatch, and um, are fed by parents in artificial species, uh, otherwise in, in some precocious ones. They also find their way on their own uh, as soon as uh, they hatch, and they grow all together in the same nest until they fledge. Okay, this is the 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 the, 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 the life cycle of the of the brood, essentially. And uh, this the whole process in pastorines can take about one month between 15 days of incubation and 15 days more or less or of uh, of uh, of uh, from hatching to fledging, right? Of growing. And then there also there is a post-fledging uh, uh, care, but this is something which goes, you know, that's another story, right? We will deal with what happens in this phase, while they are from hatching to fledging, right? This is the, the phase where they are tied, they are bound to interact. So after fledging, they may not interact, they may disperse, they may kind of have much weaker interaction. In this phase, they are forced to take the same nest, and so interaction are quite, let's say, tight, right? Uh, for, for, for space reasons, for spatial reasons, right? So, uh, um, what are the key concepts I will uh, uh, tackle in this talk? So, the main thing is altruciality, right? What do, we, what do we mean by altruciality? Maybe you know this term, maybe you already introduced it, Alessandro, the knowing uh, in your course. Uh, it's, it's the case when uh, young individuals uh, are entirely dependent on resources provided by parents, right? So, uh, in this case, altricial species, altricial bird species, which are the vast majority of the species, have a look. This, 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 uh, the, number, the sample size uh, in, this, in this review says that, let's say, 90% of the species are considered attrition, right? So in these species, uh, the, the chicks, upon hatching, depends entirely, depend entirely on resources, food, care provided by parents. Without those, they will die. They cannot find the food for themselves. This is in contrast with precocial species, let's say ducks or some whales, where just a few hours upon hatching, Birds, chicks may already be able to, to find the food by themselves, maybe with the guidance of parents, but mostly they can be able to find food by themselves. So, but most species are attrition, and this sets the seeds for competition to occur because you know, precocial species there is much weaker interaction with brood members, so they have to find the food, but they can eat more spares and so on. The other thing is that uh, uh, parents provide in attrition species mostly uh, indivisible food, so pieces of food. Uh, which uh, the birds cannot share, so they have to either take it or leave it, right? Which is a kind of which sets also the seeds for competition for color, because they cannot share in most cases. They have to either take it or, or, or leave. And but even if they can share, in many cases uh, there is there can be monopolization. So one of the nestlings in the brood, chicks in the brood, can let's say uh, monopolize the prey and consume it without sharing it with others. This also sets, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a prerequisite, important prerequisite for competition. Then, in many species, there is brood reduction. Do you know what we mean by brood reduction? Have you ever heard of this term? Of course, those which are familiar with birds, they will, but maybe others will not. I don't know, I'm trying to be more gen as general as possible because we know that many of you are not. 
uh, uh, So, uh, what happens in birds, in most species of birds, I don't say all, but we don't say all, but many, for sure, is that uh, uh, females lay more egg uh, than uh, the fledges that are actually fledged. So, uh, typically there is some mortality during the, uh, the, the, the reading phase, and which has been called this kind of parental optimism. So, that is to say, parents are optimistic in how many, how many uh, nestlings or chicks they can raise, and they lay more brood, more, more eggs than what they can actually, than the nesting that they, have, they can actually be able to rear, to rear with the parents, right? And this uh, brood reduction is quite widespread, as I said, and it, it mostly stems from the, the process of hatching asynchronous, right? So, the chicks in the brood, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in all the eggs in the, in the, in the brood, the clutch do not do not hatch at the same time. Some chicks may hatch before others, sometimes several days, which creates a hierarchy of size. So, for example, some chicks are already two or three days old in some pastoral nests, even the raptors even more in one week, if it, before the last egg lay hatches. Okay. So this creates a huge amount of differentiation in size in competitive in competitive abilities among uh, within clutches, right? Within a single clutch. And uh, uh, this, well, parents, of course, have some kind of control of this over this. Why is asynchrony is asynchrony originates? Because, as you may you may know, the parents do not lay uh, all the eggs in a clutch on the same at the same time. Normally, the same pasteurines they can lay one egg per day. They can synthesize the 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 the, 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 the energy proteins that are required, the substances that are required to fill in the egg, uh, no more than one, one egg per day. Otherwise, they will not have enough resources for themselves. So, females can lay one egg per day. In some cases, they can, they can also have longer interlay intervals, so they can, let's say, lay eggs every two or three days or even more. So, to complete a class size of 10, let's say, 10, 10 eggs, a, a female uh, blue teeth, chincha legra or, or chincharella, can take up to 10 days or 15 days. Okay, to complete the labor, right? And so what happens? Uh, at this, in this case, a female can, can decide uh, uh, whether to start incubating these eggs as soon as they are laid. This will create a huge hatching asynchrony because uh, uh, the first egg will be incubated for a much longer time, uh, for much longer than, than the last one. And this, so that means that the first egg will hatch much later, than, much earlier than, than the last one. Or they can wait uh, incubation, which sets, sets the beginning of uh, embryo development, uh, um, until all the eggs are laid. If the female uh, uh, starts, uh, uh, begins incubation uh, when all, once all the eggs are laid, this will create lower hatching asynchrony, and the egg, eggs tend to hatch at the same time. Okay. So uh, this this uh, uh, this um, asynchrony has profound influences, of course. On the interaction dynamics. Okay, the more wide, wide broad is the asynchrony, the more different in size are the nestlings which compete within the group. The more asynchronous is the uh, is the is the hatching, the more the nestlings are similar, and so this you know, lowers the amount of uh, 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 let's say um, well lowers the, uh, the 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 disparities, the asymmetries we can have in the group. Uh, when there is this asynchrony, there is a lot of competition, uh, which, uh, oh, and even when there is a synchrony, so it, this, this is independent, independently of the mechanism which creates this uh, variation in the group, uh, well, in any case, this may create some competition, uh, which can go up to, let's say, simply side, also known as Cain, right? you know, the, the, the biblical story of Cain and Abel, right? Cain, Cain is called it, yeah, Cain, right? So when, uh, when there is a uh, Cain which kills uh, Abel, right? So, uh, and, and the same happens in other broods sometimes. And this is followed, of course, by the, the difference in the size hierarchy. And then the last factor, which is very, very important, and I will focus on a lot about on it, is kinship. So the amount, the extent of genetic relatedness within the brood. This is, uh, you know, we can think, of course, they are brothers, they lose siblings, full siblings which means that they share 50% uh, uh, of, the, of the DNA. Uh, but it may happen that you have uh, cases, it's quite widespread, but there have been cases of extra paternity. 
So in those cases, you share much less of, of, of the, uh, the, the, the half products and the domestics in the group. And this is quite common in birds. This is a, a review of extra per paternity. As you can see, uh, there is variation, but there are many species where there is no extra per paternity. These are kind of strictly monogamous species where you don't have uh, uh, promiscuous matings. But many species, let's say about 90% of those species in total, have some degree of extra per paternity. So some, uh, uh, there, there is variation in genetic relatedness within broods, right? Uh, and it can, be, it can reach in some species up to 8% of offspring. Which are known, well, are non genetic offspring of, the, of, the, of one of the parents, let's say. Nobody didn't know my genetic But it can be, there are also mixed in there, and also intra brute parasitism, which is something which happens. So females may lay eggs also in, uh, in, uh, in the eggs, uh, in the nest of other females. Yeah, this is intra brute parasitism, in IBP, right? Uh, which is quite widespread also. Not, not as much as extra paternity, but quite widespread. And then, of course, there is higher blue parasites that we, so we have seen uh, before. This also creates a situation where you have a peculiar situation where you have uh, siblings, maybe, and one individual which is completely unrelated. It's another species, right? It's a, it's a parasite. So this also cr uh, creates some, some complexities in the interaction dynamics within the brood. Okay. So, uh, of course, we can uh, see this. Uh, Variation. Uh, most, in, most, in most striking cases are intense fight, as we will see, uh, of intensity of conflicts very high, and then we can have also cooperation among, among the individuals in the brood. And there are a number of factors, as we said, that, that can uh, affect this uh, variation, this continuum uh, uh, of uh, interactions from fighting to cooperation. Presumption of wounds, uh, this, this is typically something which uh, as, as I mean, I'm an ecologist, so. I'm mostly interested in this aspect of how environments or how resource abundance affects interaction and the behavior of individuals. And, and uh, so, with low resource abundance, you would expect higher intensity of conflicts, of course, because less resources to share and more intense conflicts. High resource abundance, a bit more relaxed competition, right? This is something which may affect the number of competitors. So, if we have few, you have low degree of. Uh, of uh, uh, interactions and conflicts. If you are many in a room, then you can have a lot of conflict. Uh, kinship, as I said, and uh, so unrelated uh, uh, nestlings are likely to have stronger conflicts than related ones. And we will uh, in, we'll talk more about this. This is important. This is a very important topic. And uh, and then of course attrition precaution. In the precaution ones, you will have little, let's say, interactions for 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 food because because every individual can find food from. from for itself, whereas in other regions, once you are, they, are, they are bound to the same nest, and this creates a lot of interactions. So this is something uh, which uh, summarizes the, 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 the topic. So uh, let's go to have a look at a few, you know, striking examples of conflicts. This is something which has been always puzzling behavioral ecologists and also evolutionary biologists. Uh, so. Uh, of course, uh, siblicide is something which, you know, to us humans, which are highly cooperative species, sounds really, really bad, right? So this is something which has been really attracting a lot of attention among the evolutionary biology. But it's just a human bias because we are cooperative, and when we see this kind of situation where a newly hatched of all eagles kills its 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 seed, right? Just a few days upon hatching, what they do is that they kill, they liberate the seed, right? Without any apparent reason, that's the key, that's the key point. Uh, uh, there is no food shortage in this case. Uh, this is this, this the canism happens is is defined as a case of siblicide without food shortage. So often they eat the, the, the chick, but it's not because they need it, just because the, they, they kill it and then it's there and then it's consumed. But it, it's not needed, right? It's not necessary for the others to survive. They have enough food for both, but in, also in those cases. Uh, 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 one chick, one chick came, he was the other able, right? And uh, this is really something which is uh, it's very it's quite common in a few groups, especially raptors. And what they, they in a review they, they started on uh, this uh, uh, topic in raptors, they found, for example, that there is uh, this is quite widespread in many species. And uh, well. Uh, the positive thing is it does, it, it, it's, it's that it seems to be more widespread in those species 
which have, uh, um, let's say, uh, more difficulties for juveniles to find the territory and to, to settle themselves. It's kind of a, a, a competition for future reproduction starts already when they are in the nest, right? So uh, other species, they fledge and then they find a territory, sometimes they do. But in those species where there is, a, let's say, delayed maturation, very delayed maturation, so for example, let's say, uh, the, the bearded vulture, or gibetto, okay, these species, they, have, they can reproduce, they produce the first time when they are seven, eight years old. It's very difficult for a juvenile to set in a territory and to, uh, and to, 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 uh, to obtain a mate and so on. Uh, in these species, canism is more, is more widespread than in other species which have, let's say, a more relaxed lifestyle, right? So this is one of the, of the uh, ecological reasons for, uh, for, for the evolution of canism. And then on the parental side, it seems that this behavior is kind of uh, 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 promoting the survival of the strongest one. Right? So if there are two, one maybe would maybe there might be some inbreeding, so one might be a bit weak. Okay, the strongest one survives. Normally, 90% of cases, the strongest one is the uh, the senior chick, and the weakest one is the weak the the the, the junior chick. So that the smallest one, because there is this async we talked about. Um, other cases which are also quite striking is eaglets. Uh, these are cattle eagle uh, nestlings, as you see, there are two cattle eagles. One of, the, uh, one of these is pushing down another sheep, down the nest. This is going to die for sure, they will fall on the ground, will be predated, will not be fed anymore by parents. And this is actively pushed down from the nest from, from the other, uh, from by the other siblings, right? Uh, they are not killing it, but they will do directly, but they will do it by, by pushing it down the nest. And, uh, and, and if you ever seen a video of egrets interacting for food with their parents, this is a very violent moment where all the chicks with these with this, uh, this strong bills and like, pointed bills, they really peck at each other and at the parents' bill. I, I, I really I don't understand how you don't get all blind because it's really amazing. So they, it's so, so, so pointed, the, the bill of the species, which uh, it's really surprising to me. Uh, and so anyway, uh, this is this is a quite common in egrets. This uh, brood reduction, this is active brood reduction, right? So one bird kills the other. Also, another uh, interest is very interesting system is the one of uh, uh, boobies, uh, which are uh, the Sula species of the uh, um, tropical area. And uh, when there is this, is, as you can see here, there is a, a, a an aging. Uh, pushing away from nest uh, 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 a senior chick, pushing away a junior chick, and probably forcing him to, let's say, land the nest and uh, be killed by other adults which are nearby, because he may invade the territory of another adult, be killed by other adults, or let's say, don't receive food anymore. Uh, so, this is quite, this is the, the, one of the most uh, striking examples of conflicts, as I said. But of course, there is also cooperation. So, uh, especially in recent, recent years, there has been, a, uh, let's say, a greater appreciation that interactions in, in, in nesting groups, in bird groups, are not just competition and, let's say, uh, rivalry among nestlings, but there is some kind of positive interactions, right? Uh, this is the, the, one of the most interesting uh, uh, species in this respect is the barn owl. Barn owl is incredibly, uh, the chicks in the barn owl broods are incredibly uh, uh, communicative among themselves. They help each other, and there is a, a really interesting uh, dynamic going on. Um, this is a, a paper that has been, well, Andrea has been involved also, which has been published a couple of years ago in American Naturalist, and uh, where they show that uh, there is a, a kind of allo feeding. So there are um, the, uh, the, the, the senior chicks that actively feed their yeah, junior ones. Instead of killing them as the other species, they kind of feed them actively. By the food brought by the parents. Of course, this is not, well, this depends on the, the amount of available food. There is quite a strong growth reduction in Barnau nests, so sometimes the, the, the last, uh, the last hatch of chicks uh, will die uh, in most, most, most cases. But if there is enough food, then the, the old ones actively help the junior ones to, to, to uh, the older chicks actively help the, the junior ones to, uh, to fledge and to, get, uh, to make their life. And, uh, well, uh, the other thing is that uh, this, this uh, kind of allo feeding, where uh, uh, senior chicks uh, uh, help the others, uh, uh, is based on the, uh, how the, the, the junior chicks signal their hunger level, right? So 
what what happens in uh, in burnouts? Maybe you know this uh, this thing, Dimitri. There is this this phenomenon which is negotiation, right? They call it this this something which has been uh, um, proposed by Alexander Roland, which is uh, one of the world leading experts of of uh, burnouts. He's been making his whole career studying burnouts all over the world, and uh, he's a very funny guy, very lots of ideas, very brilliant one, uh, and. Um, Alexander, uh, uh, by looking at the interaction between nestlings and house groups, notice that they continuously chat. So they stay close together and they chat. They, they, they make some noise, some, some calls, which are unrelated to the present. So, so you know, most birds, they do begging. You know what begging is? One bird uh, call for parents to, to get the food. Okay, provide some, now some, some vocalizations to attract the parents to, to, for, for food. So in this case, the nesting bow mouse, they vocalize in the nest without the parents. With the parents, they, they feed the birds, uh, the, the nesting, let's say, two, three times per night, maybe two, no, not more. And so this, they have long times, long hours, where all the nesting are in the nest like this, doing nothing. And they interact. They greet each other uh, among themselves. They, they chat. They chat. And, and this chatting uh, has been called, uh, I mean, has, has been shown by Alexander to be, to be adapted. In, because by chatting, uh, they kind of decide who is going to receive the next feeding that the, the parents will bring to them. So in this way, by uh, negotiating who is going to be the neediest one, and the, more, the, the, one, the chick which is most motivated to get food, they, they avoid basically the risk of involving competition. It's, you know, one house, they are strong clothes, strong bills. If they fight, they can kill each other. It's very risky for everybody. So they want to avoid, they, they, by, by doing so, by, what, by, by, by let's say, chatting, by, by negotiation, negotiating, they decide who is going to receive the next food, the, the next food item brought by parents. This is incredible system. They, 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 they publish a lot of papers about this. It's really uh, so funny to see these videos of, of uh, I was chatting and, and chatting moving, also they, also they, they, they do head movements, so it's very funny uh, to see. It's very, let's say, you know, uh, I was, a really human back because they have this this face with frontal eyes. There, you you can really get in, in let's say contact with in touch with them. It's, it's something which is really really fun to see. Um, so this is a, a couple of uh, highlights from this paper, and you see that uh, uh, this is the number of other feeding given per night. So feeding provided by the senior by one of the chicks to another one, other chicks in the brood, and most other feeding are done as you can see. By the senior chicks towards the other. So the senior chicks does most of the other thing. Decides who's going to take this the next uh, one of the food items which he has not consumed. Of course, it's the senior, so he will consume first. But then the other will decide based on what, based on how needy the other chicks are, how they 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 produce they produce, uh, 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 they produce uh, um, uh, how they negotiate, but also how much they they, they provide breeding. You know breeding. What is the breeding behavior? You have, have, have an idea what breeding is. So it's when uh, birds, you know, clean the plumage with the bill. Maybe something can be taken from friends, but yes, yeah, it's when uh, grooming. It's like grooming in mammals, right? So, uh, so you have, in, in, in mammals you have grooming and allo grooming when uh, some animals groom another. Here we have breeding and allo breeding when some birds breed another, right? And so here, the, the, as I said, they spend many hours in the nest without having nothing to do because there is. Uh, no parents to, to interact with, and they, they are there, and they do well breed. The, other, the breeding uh, uh, is very important for birds because it allows, as you may imagine, to remove parasites, ectoparasites. So birds are full of ectoparasites, they have uh, uh, ticks, they have malophaga, uh, they have you know, lots of other uh, but ectoparasites, mostly have ticks and malophaga, I would say. Maybe there are also some, some, some uh, camifora, which are the, uh, 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 so it's uh, so it's uh, it's a uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, deep tap, right? Yeah. So they have cyclotoparasites. Now there are also smaller, smaller ones, um, uh, the acari and so. But the biggest ones they can be removed mostly by the brain. So the ticks and the and the and the, and the, and the and can be removed by the brain. So by bringing each other, especially in places where they cannot really, let's say in the, on the neck or or on the shoulders on on areas which cannot be reached by their own uh, bill, which are on the back of the head, then it's a place where most allo breeding, of course, from other birds, clean uh, the, the other uh, with 
that we bear of the, of the uh, name and so on. So what happens here is that the more of the breeding uh, one in nestling does towards another, the more likely is the probability that it will, that it will receive an allophilic, an allophilic, so it will be fed by its sibling. I think it will be fed by its sibling. And then also there is an effect on negotiation, but it's not shown in this paper. So here is, is a, a small video. It's not very good in quality, but you can see. Uh, then I will try to make it running. Sorry. How does it work? Here. You see there is a, a senior chick. Looks like an adult, but it's a senior chick. Look at the junior one. The junior one is much smaller, right? So there is a huge size hierarchy in the brood. So one house can lay up to 10 eggs. So the last chick can hatch ages later than the first one, and there is this. This looks like adults, but they are chicks, right? Grown chicks, but and the other one is a sibling, so it's the last hatch of the last hatch ones. And so you see that this 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 senior chick grow directly uh, uh, by mice to the small one, right? This is an adult feeding, okay? And, and uh, probably this, this chick has been providing allopri in exchange for this feeding. So it's very interesting, this cooperation of in nestings in banals. Uh, a, a couple of other examples. There are not many examples of cooperation, but yeah, uh, there is some, uh, some examples here. This has been a, quite a debated paper which came out a few years ago on biology letters, and not very much, I think it's very interesting, but I, I really had to think about it, whether it's something I really grasped exactly what happened, what has happened to this stuff. But anyway. And uh, what this, they show, or they supposedly show, is that uh, um, this is a study done on, on black headed gulls, okay, which lays clutches of one, uh, which has broods of one to three chicks. Okay, uh, so it's a typical gull. Um, uh, and in this species, uh, they show, this, this small experiment show, that uh, the amount of uh, Let's say investment that chicks do in bang banging, of course, is the, 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 say the vocalization of the birds do, the chicks do to attract food from parents. Uh, it's mostly directed to parents, but also it's been directed to nestmates, as we see by mouse where they chat, and also in other, we will see later in mouse follows where they do the same or similar things. So, uh, this is um, uh, the number of, uh, of backing per chicks, the, the investment, the energetic investment, bang banging means cost, of course, vocalizing. It's, it's something they have the best energy for the right? So it's quite costly. And it's, it's, uh, it shows that in single broods, uh, the number of baby bows per nesting is higher than in three, uh, uh, three in broods composed of three chicks. So it's, it's, it's like that if, if there are more chicks, uh, they kind of invest less per chick into, into, into baby, which is a, you know, kind of a spare of energy, right? And, but apparently, in uh, rules of three, where they also make less, they cannot take more food. This is a bit tricky. I'm not sure I, got, I really got this paper right completely. But uh, what they show, what they said is that uh, uh, the nestlings respond to the total amount of uh, 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 signal, which comes from the brood all together, all the three, right? And they said that it's more likely uh, uh, that they will, uh, so the bag intensity is higher when you have more chicks bang at the same time rather than a single one. And in this case, it's more likely that the parents will regurgitate the food that the chicks will eat. So it's, it's kind of a coordination by the, the siblings in the brood that kind of uh, shifts the conflicts they have with parents. Of course, there is a conflict with parents, parents and offspring because parents tend to provide less food that, than the chicks actually would need, and the, the, the chicks tend to require more food than they actually need. And this conflict, so far, of course, it ends with that kind of, uh, which is often enough for both. What is often enough for both is that cross selection of flowers, uh, is when the, the, the amount of investment that is often optimal for both uh, the adult and the nest. So, in this way, apparently, by coordinating the efforts to go begging towards, uh, towards the parents, the chicks cannot take more food than if they are alone. So they cannot coordinate. So there is kind of cooperation, right? Which are in between chicks, which flowers obtaining food. Well, this is really something which I, I have to. Uh, when this paper came out, I was quite puzzled. I really, I, still now, many years after this, we published, there's not been many, many, many follow up of this. But it's something I I, I, hope, I, have, I think you can can look at and yeah, maybe I will, uh, understand better what is going on here. Because this is so strange to me. But anyway, another thing, uh, this is another study where they showed, for example, uh, uh, this is published on a quite uh, 
let's say, straight journal, I've never heard of. But it's very interesting because, because it shows that the allopril, we already saw in our mouths, is more frequent, of course more often, in uh, when there is uh, roots composed experimentally by uh, siblings. So this, this is a study done in captivity, uh, uh, siblings, four siblings, and roots with mixed uh, uh, siblings from two different groups, so they kind of create a situation of, uh, of experimental, experimental reduced kinship among root members. And they show that uh, kinship uh, promotes uh, allopril. So allopril tends to be more frequent when the, the two nesting are related. They cooperate more often if they are related. If they are not, they tend not to cooperate much, so they don't do allopril, right? So kinship is very important. We said that the amount of relatedness between nestlings is very important in shaping their interaction. Um, and we'll go, we'll go to that later. Uh, so then just to make a sort of cap what we've been saying up to now, uh, the, the historical perspective came, went from, uh, uh, the, the, this is a very key, paper, key book uh, written by Doug Mock and Jeff Parker, Parker uh, which as you say from the title is Devolution of Civil Primary. Primary the cause you of fighting. And in fact, it shows a brood of eaglets fighting uh, each other. So this was the, 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 the classical perspective. But more recently, ten years later, we have been uh, there has been there, uh, well, the things have been changing, and more appreciation of cooperation among group members emerged. And so now we kind of have a more uh, broader view of interactions, which we call sibling symbiosis, right? Symbiosis is not the right term, in my opinion, but still it shows that there is kind of strict interaction between S which we can be negative, but can also be positive. So negative symbiosis is parasitism, basically. Uh, a positive symbiosis is mutualistic relationship or cooperation, right? So um, yeah, so this has been a shift, a shift in, uh, in perspective among the, uh, the students of this topic from the, the, the seminal uh, book by, by Mokka Parker to, to these more recent developments, right? And the Barnau studies have been contributing a lot to this shift in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, focus and, and so on. So I would now focus a bit more on kinship and how it uh, uh, kind of can shape intergroup social interactions. Uh, some you know, basic theories, maybe it's something you've already been talking about in your course, I don't know. Mm -hmm. really? Yeah, okay. So, uh, what is kin selection? Kin selection is for a fundamental uh, topic in this context, and it's that evolutionary strategy which favors the fitting of an organism, not only of, of own individual, but also of relatives, right? So, uh, even this comes to a cost to the, or the single or individual survivor of protection. So, if the individual is a relative, you might, have, you might gain some fitness benefits by helping, because it shares a part of your genome, you know, right? Uh, uh, and so, uh, a fundamental, let's say, uh, element of kin of kin selection is inclusive the concept of inclusive fitness. So, fitness is not just your own fitness, which is direct fitness, uh, which you can achieve by surviving and reproducing more, but also how much your relatives, especially the stricter relatives, so the let's say brothers and sisters, uh, gain in fitness because they share part of your genome. So, the unit of selection in this case is not individual, but it's the, the gene. Right, the genome, the gene actually. Uh, so uh, you can, you, you should see, you uh, as a single individual should see your fitness not only composed by what you achieve, but what also your relatives achieve. Okay, and so uh, uh, there is a direct a fit, inclusive fitness as a direct fitness component and indirect fitness component, which is the fitness of your relatives. And uh, Hamilton formalized this in the sixties already. Uh, with the, the so-called Hamilton's rule, and uh, it shows that whenever the indirect fitness benefits exceed the direct fitness cost for the individual, then mutualist, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, more cooperative behavior might emerge, more, more, more mutualistic behavior might emerge. Uh, and, and in those cases, exactly uh, relating to a, a brood of, of, of birds, of a single offspring uh, may reduce their self selfishness, and so kin selection may emerge. They may be less selfish in case where there is uh, 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 the cost you pay for having, a, let's say, a, 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 a favorable, favorable act towards your relative 
uh, is, uh, uh, is, is when this cost is low and the direct fitness balance is higher, then this this this, this is favorable to translation. So that's, that's the idea. And um, and of course, the Hamilton's rule. A key aspect of the Hamilton's rule is the relatedness. So the higher the relatedness, the more the more likely that this kind of selfish selfishness is reduced and cooperation and, and uh, uh, mutualistic relationship, positive interaction may, may emerge. Uh, so, of course, if, if individuals are clones, so in genetically identical, this is that's important. Of course, for example, in EU social species, then of course it's complete uh, selfishness. So, the therapy, your, your relative, which is exactly clone, can be, can be the same, it's, it's the same as, as, as uh, therapy yourself. So, this is the most striking pattern, of course, of, of, uh, of uh, mutualistic relationships. So, um, what happens is that begging intensity. This is to, going back to, to birds. Uh, we show that the intensity of nestlings vary with similar relations. This was a fundamental paper uh, of, by James Brisky, published, published in Proceedings Royal Society in 94, uh, and where he showed that by, he made a comparative study and he showed that uh, the amount of begging, uh, in terms of loudness, so the amount of energy invested in producing loud signals to parents, increased. Increase it with extra preparation for attack. So the less the nesting were related, the more birds invested into, uh, into producing signals to attract food from parents. Okay. Whereas, so in more species where the extra preparation is low, competition is less high, less intense. Whereas in, in, in broods where, where there is a huge probability of having extra their youngs, then competition is higher. Because you don't have relatives, so you don't care, you want to steal food from them. There is less. According to Hamilton's rules, this makes perfect sense, right? So, but have a look at this graph. Is that, is that everything okay with this graph? You, don't you notice any strange pattern in it, Alessandro, or you? Come on, Dimitri. What is strange here? You know birds. It's very strange that the advantage of 100%. Yeah, exactly. Good point. What is this? Oh. Remember those two question marks where we saw them? Yes. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> this is a good parasite. This is the begging intensity of good parasite. One of the highest ones. Well, it's not one of but It's very high. It's not one of the highest, but still one of the, the highest ones. So this is a cowbird. Cowbird, this, this, this study has been done on several species, including an American one. This is a cowbird. Maybe you have seen a cowbird in, uh, in uh, America. I've never seen one. But uh, it's, uh, it's a strange parasite which uh, uh, lays its uh, egg in other men. It's a bad food parasite. Uh, but the chick hatches and does not kill the other chicks. But it grows with them. So uh, the, 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 this is the food parasite, and this is the host chick. They grow together. Of course, the chick, these chicks they don't grow very well. <laughs> the parasite is, is, is normally a bit bigger than, 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 than the other ones, but still they grow and they have reflex sometimes also, which is different, difficult for uh, different, for example, from the cuckoo. The cuckoo, the common cuckoo, we all know that the chicks, as soon as they hatch, they will throw all their nestlings or eggs out of the nest. This doesn't, doesn't happen in the cowbirds. The cowbirds grow, the, the young cowbird grows with the chicks of the other birds, and they, they, they they grow together. But their bank intensity is one of the highest. Because, of course, it will grow, it's likely to grow with uh, other totally unrelated siblings. So, no way to share with them anything. Uh, he has to take all, as much food as, as he can, right? The young person. And, in fact, this is really <laughs> an outlier in this, more almost an outlier in this, this relationship, right? Yeah, in fact, this is a, uh, well, so, uh, something which has been done by one of uh, uh, by, by people in our group, uh, the late Nicola Saino, which died a couple of years ago. Uh, um, sh they show in a comparative paper, a comparative study comparing different uh, uh, amount of uh, baby intensity in cowbird hosts, uh, that uh, the amount of uh, baby produced by cowbird hosts, chicks, increases with 
the probability of having root bars in mean, So, as, you, as we said before, uh, call bars beg loud, beg very loudly, but also their hosts, they are selected to beg loudly in response to this increasing risk of parasitism by cowbirds. Not all species are equally parasitized by cowbirds, some species are poorly parasitized on this side of the graph. Some, some are highly likely to be parasitized by the cowbirds, so this is residual, so don't, we don't care about the, the, the numbers. But yeah, these, are, these species are highly likely to have a, a, a cowbird in the nest, because they are more exposed to them. And so uh, in these species, nestlings are selected to, uh, uh, to uh, beg louder, to overcome. Of course, the, 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 there is kind of harmless race going on, right? So the parasites beg more, but also the hosts beg more. Anyway, this is nice. Okay, then uh, uh, I'm not sure whether, whether I'm, I'm still in time, but this is the most. Uh, yeah, good for it. Okay. So now we'll uh, focus a bit more on our own contributions to this. Up to now, I've been making say, general uh, uh, overview of these interactions. Now we'll focus a bit more on the studies we did on, uh, on some species, especially the barnswallow. Uh, we did a couple of some works on Mass Follow uh, some years ago, it's not recent, not recent work, but then it will also show, show, show some more recent work on other species. The Mass Follow uh, is a, uh, is a, is a, no, a passerine, a migratory passerine, uh, which uh, doesn't, well, it's not as fascinating as Mass Follow, of course, and not as interesting in the interaction, it's very standard, quite standard of the passerine, right? Uh, but it has a huge advantage. It's highly tolerant of disturbance. It's how you can do many experimental work in the field and the birds do not care much. So you can manipulate nesting, take them out of the nest, put them back in the nest, uh, create broods of different sizes. The birds, they don't care. Well, they do some, some, some stress calls, but then they will start feeding and feeding the nesting as much as you can. So you can manipulate brood size, blood size, you can do you know, many. They are very resilient. And this is, of course, and of course they are quite abundant. You can have sample size, which is quite good, and with not much effort. And one important thing of Van uh, which is, has been, which has been why she has, she has been, it has been a focus of a lot of behavioral studies, is that you can easily videotape them, videotape interactions. This is something you, you cannot easily do with bird nests, unless they are nest boxes, but with no open nesters like the Van Swallows, it's not easy. It's not easy. If you go, if you have to place a camera in a bush, it's quite complicated to have a good recordings of videos. Van Swallows are very easy. They bring in rooms, in houses, you have, you have, uh, you have the, uh, uh, the electricity, you, have, you can uh, connect your camera to electricity. It's very easy to do it. So, most, most, most of all, I think one of the biggest reasons for studying bounce flowers is that it's, uh, it's uh, quite a convenient species to work on. Okay, so, uh, there are no special things to that happen, but then, of course, there are some, some interesting dynamics which go on, which make it very useful for these studies. Uh, but yeah, so brood size is normally four to five offspring, up to six or seven in some cases. There is some extra pervariate paternity, so there is uh, uh, space for uh, non-kin in the broods. Uh, there is very limited brood reduction, and hatching is mostly synchronous, so all, all chicks uh, hatch at the same time from eggs. Nestling can perform banging, and they do so by uh, mostly uh, uh, stretching their neck when the parents arrive. And opening them up again, right? Uh, um, and some also the event localization in these cases, right? Uh, frequent uh, nesting is fed fre frequently by, by, by parents bringing single insect or several, several insects uh, at the same time. And this happens up to 10, 20 times per hour. So it's quite frequent. So when you look at uh, the bunch swallow nest with nestlings, parents always go back and forth bringing food to the nestlings. And, um, and yes, and they, go, they also do something which is, well, it's not actually as it happens in the, in the barn house, but they do begging also when parents are not there. So if you look at a road of, of, of uh, barn palos, and the bird, maybe you close the door so the birds cannot enter the room where the, 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 nest, the nest is, after, after some time you will see that they start begging, even if nothing happens. So they are just, let's say, kind of, the kind of, uh, uh, motivated to beg even without parents. This is parent absent begging, which is quite com common in birds. And we'll see, uh, which we'll have a look later, at this more in detail. So, the first study, uh, which maybe I, I, for, I Alessandro forwarded to you, students, is one of this one. Uh, this has been published some years ago in the Journal of Evolution Biology, and the title is quite, quite nice, one of the best I, 
go slow those beetles will, uh, the, <laughs> will, will, be, will recognize something, some patterns in this. Anyway, uh, the aim of the study was to assess how Netflix modulate the own level, level, their, level their, their own level of pegging according to the uh, amount of need, of the, the extent of need of their siblings. Uh, so the idea was that if there is key selection, if key selection operates in this, in this system, uh, mm, the, let's say that one of the less, le less need in estimating the rule should reduce its level of competition when parents arrive with food to allow its king to receive the food. Okay, if the, if the king is needier than him. So you, we needed to create to to to. to to assess this, we had to create asymmetries in need of nestings. How you can do this? Any idea? Suggestion? How you can create an asymmetry in the need of nesting, the need for food? What can we do? Take it away from the nest. Exactly. Put the pride in them. That's something we can easily be done with bad solves. So this is a uh, well. I don't have good videos because this, these studies are quite old. All the videos are in a external drive which now does not connect anymore to the so I couldn't obtain a good video but this is a, a gift which shows uh, yeah, parents coming have a look at this there are four nestlings have a look at what they do three of them as soon as the parents arrive open their mouth and one of them get the food look at this one on the left on the left you know you see it doesn't it doesn't do anything okay this is probably satiated nestling because right it's uh, it, it, not me it doesn't do any any begging anything right so this is something interesting to look at. So what we did, sorry, now I have to stop this, otherwise we can get, I don't know how to do it, but yeah, anyway, I will tell. What we did is we created a similar diets of similarly sized nestlings. Uh, so we had a brood of four, we took them all out of the nest, we left two in the nest, the most similar ones, right? We did, we did an experiment, so to, to test this prediction that Kind of modulate their begging their extent of competition according to the need of the, the, the level of need of the nesting. So we took the, the brood out of the nest, we left two, and we did a before food deprivation BFT trial, right? Where we left two nestlings in the nest, the other two kept in the bag, the cock bag, and, and these were normally fed by parents, but nothing happens. So if you take two, two out of the brood, as I said, it's very convenient species, so you can. Uh, uh, you, can, you can take out the nest, they don't care, they just come on feeding. And we did uh, 90 minutes video recording of interactions and uh, uh, between uh, these two nestlings before food deprivation. Okay? One day. The day after, the same two nestlings were, uh, were filming again. But before filming again, one of them, this one, food deprived, was food deprived. So it was taken out of the, the nest uh, for 120 minutes, a couple, so two hours, which is not. Uh, they can they can manage they, they don't they don't suffer much just just they're just a bit more hungry than the others consider that when one swallows uh, when there is a, let's say a thunderstorm they are they, they find they, they food on they feed on on aerial insects right so when there is a thunderstorm the nest which lasts maybe some five or six hours may rain for, for some time they don't they don't they don't have food because they can the parents cannot find food so it's normal for them to have periods quite long in the day of, of food deprivation. So this is not that nothing, nothing special. It's food deprivation it may seem bad for, for them, but it's not so bad. So one of the nests was food deprived, the other was not, and we let them compete again. The same two nests, right? And the others were still out of the, of the room. And uh, another 90 minutes of trials of, of video recordings. And so uh, we score all of these video recordings uh, uh, the amount, the intensity of bank. How much the begging? How much? How much the uh, nestlings were begging? Uh, the begging was scored on a zero to four scale. So uh, zero is there's nothing, as the one we've seen in the, the clip before. So it's just stand still, they don't open the mouth, they don't do that, anything, don't stretch the neck. And four is when they gain the kind of, uh, you know, most intense begging and they ask for food. And there are some intermediate scores also. So for every uh, time the, the parent can the nest, we score the bit of his nesting. There can be many, many, many events in one of the 90, 90 minutes uh, video recordings, 50, 60 events. So uh, now let's focus on the left part of, the, of this graph, which shows the, the initial uh, feedings obtained by, by, by the chicks. 
forget about the intermediate mass, which are, you know, in the, in the, in the 90 minutes trials, uh, this is the first third, 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 third seed, well, the 33% of, of feedings, the first 33% of feedings in each group. They are one is what happens later. So, but later, of course, things are a bit more common because they, they, they become associated both of them. And of course, this is not very less interesting. But the most interesting patterns emerge in the first third of feedings, okay, the initial ones, so soon after who placed the, 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 the birth in the uh, So, the before, uh, the before, this is quite complicated, but yeah, notice it. So the design was, as I, as I said, it was quite, as I explained, was quite complicated. But look at the before for the prevention uh, trial. So, this is. White, uh, white bars, right? The white bars show, well, similar bagging intensity between estimates, right? Similar. They, they don't, they, of course, it's before the prevention, so they, the, the bagging intensity is equal between the estimates. And uh, um, the, the other two bars, the darker ones instead, shows what happens in the, the after food deprivation trials. So one of the lessons for the prime. This is the food deprived nestling. This is the non food deprived nestling. Okay? FD and F, uh, NFD. So this is NFD. As you can see, the food deprived nestling increases a lot because it's needy, as it's, more, it's more hungry, right? So he, he has more food. Whereas the other one decreases compared to himself when he was uh, competing with Zoho. There is a kind of, so the needy of nestlings uh, uh, um, kind of. Uh, um, uh, the less needy nestling uh, kind of steps back, so it does not interact as strong as it was competing uh, when when they know uh, similarly uh, the, uh, the prime nesting, so similarly needy nesting, as in the before for the prevention trial. So there is either both an increase of intensity of, inter of, of competition by the needy nesting, which is expected, but also a decrease of competition by the less needy nesting, which is exactly what you expect in case of competition to occur. Okay, so the same, this is for making intensity, for the number of feedings received, the same, so this nesting receives less. But then, of course, things kind of mix later on, because this happens in the third, in the first initial, initial uh, uh, feedings, then all nesting, they, they both they became the same level of hunger, and they, they kind of equalize their intensity, bagging intensity. And the same for the proportion of feeding received. Uh, the non-food deprived nestlings, that is to say, the less needy ones, uh, in, uh, in the before food deprivation trial, Obtains the same amount, about 50%, 55% of Phoenix, but in after food deprivation trials, he obtains much less, 25%. Because he leaves, he leaves food to the other next, which is more needed. Okay? And uh, yeah, the body mass change, of course, is uh, the same, has the same pattern. So in the, before food deprivation trial, there is the body mass change in the other two nests is very similar. In the after food deprivation trial, so nests were weighted. Uh, with, a, with a spring balance before the trial and after the trial, so as to see how much mass they gain in, the, in the, those, day, those period. And as you see, in the after food duration trial, the, the more needy nesting gain more mass than the other. So, obtainable feeding gain more mass. That's okay. That makes sense. Okay. So, another study, uh, Stephen Barnes Wallace, published uh, some years ago again, uh, was on parent absence. As I as said, Maxwell's may perform begging, also when parents are not there, right? So, and we uh, analyze what, which were the consequences of this uh, parent absence signaling on sibling competition and sibling interaction. Now we call it competition, but maybe it was better to say interactions. Anyway. Uh, the aim was to uh, check whether, first of all, whether this parent absence begging is kind of an honest signal of need. So, the idea is that, like in the bad house, uh, when the, uh, the nesting is more needy, it will perform more of this parent absent banging. This parent absent banging, uh, of course, cannot be directed to any, it's a, it's a, it's a manifest, behavioral manifestation, which cannot be directed to anybody else than the siblings, okay? Because there is no, nobody else in the room, just the siblings in the nest. So why to bang? Because you have, maybe, maybe you want to say something to, 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 uh, to, the, to your sibling, like it happens in our house. There, well, of course, we, can say, we cannot say whether this is kind of an active choice, like it happens in one house. But, uh, but of course, uh, it can be a signal which is perceived by the other. So, it may be, so the, the nesting may do parent ups and the begging, let's say, for uh, they are highly ex, uh, motivated to do because they are hungry, 
uh, maybe that's the idea, and uh, and the others, well, they just perceive this as as you know as something which may, may, may they may exploit to to to, to adjust their behavior on a very, very fine scale. So the idea was that this could reduce the cost of civil competition. So if you see that your team is a kind of very motivated to the food, you may step back. You may not be needed as needy as your sibling, and you may step back and preserve your energy when you're more needy, right? So this kind of creates an affirmation of neediness among siblings to reduce the cost of competition of, inter of let's say, producing banking, cow, coals, and so on. So uh, we need, uh, we, we, uh, first of all, we had to demonstrate that parental time banking is honesty. So it occurs among nestlings that are more needy. Okay? So how would you do that? How could you test that? It's quite easy. You do a food deprivation and see whether food deprived nestling produce more uh, parental time banking than non food deprived ones. This, we use the same data set that we used in the previous paper for this one. So um, I think the same experimental design. But then, if this if this honest honesty of signal of the parent is is is, uh, is true, then we may expect that the less needy nestling use exploit this cue to uh, perceive the motivation of the siblings to uh, the willing the willingness to compete for food and maybe step back and also compete a bit less vigorously for the next food item brought by parents. So the idea was that nestling performing parent absent banging, we call it PAB uh, for, 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 for the sake of brevity, in the interfeeding event, so between one feeding and the other by the parents, should be more likely to receive food. That's the idea. So you do this parent absent banging, you, you, dis you, dis you display either intentionally or not, we don't know. Uh, as I said, it's not like chatting by mouse, but kind of. But we may expect that you know these nestlings which perform this, this behavior are more likely to get the food than the next when the parents comes to the nest. So the experimental design is the same as we said. The one is the same stuff, the data set analyzed in a different way with a different perspective. Okay, uh, this is the result. So first of all, first result, uh, ch let's check if parental banging is an honest signal of need. And let's check whether uh, there is a difference in the amount of parental banging produced in the after food deprivation trial by the food deprived nest needs compared to the non food deprived one. And this is the case. Uh, this is what happens in the number of uh, uh, parent absent banking events. It's about two per nestling on average in the uh, before food deprivation trial, so before the control trial. And as you see, it almost doubles in the food deprived nestling after food deprivation. So uh, food deprived nestlings are twice as likely to produce parent absent banking than uh, non food deprived ones, right? Um, and also we measure, well, it is not very significant, but we measure the intensity of, of uh, parental absent banking. So, uh, but this was similar. It's some, some, a bit higher than the private nesting, but not much. So when they do uh, parental absent banking, it's mostly, it's mostly, uh, it's not a matter of intensity of banking on a zero four scale, we said, but it's mostly a matter of frequency of banking events, right? It's a bit also a bit more, more, more stronger banking, but not, not much. Anyway, we can conclude for sure that this is another signal of need. So when they do parent absent banking, they are needy. Okay. The second result was to test what happens in the still in the diets of, of competing nestlings. Um, uh, and we, we showed that parent absent banking by the media sibling is associated with more intense banking in the subsequent feeding events by parents. Uh, so, uh, this is what happens in the before for the prevention trials, so the control trials. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the begging intensity. So, we, we look at, uh, the, we identify which nest did the parent absent begging, and then we score its begging intensity when the parents arrive, soon after, the, the, the soon after the, 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 he did the parent absent begging. As I said, it's very frequent, so you have many, many uh, uh, parent absent begging, then parents arrive. So, the immediate event of feeding just after producing uh, parent absent banking. And indeed, there was a significant effect. Uh, so uh, the, uh, when an essay was doing uh, a pa uh, parent, uh, parent absent banking, it was making more intensely when the parents arrived. Okay? Uh, whereas uh, this was not the case in the feeding events produced when no parent absent banking occurs, or when the sibling was doing parent absent banking. 
This is interesting because when the sibling produced parents are a begging, then the nestling, the other nestling was doing a less intense begging towards the, when the parents arrived. So uh, it, it works. It seems that it works. When, when they do they produce a, a, a parental sebaking, they are willing to pick more vigorously for the next feeding. Event. Okay? And it, this is especially exacerbated in the, uh, in the, um, in the after food uh, deprivation trial. And especially for the food of private nestling, as you see, this is very needy. So uh, even if the, uh, if the, uh, the sibling was doing parental sebaking, the needy nestling was still uh, vocalizing, uh, producing begging at the maximum rate. Whereas the, the, need, the control nesting was reducing a lot this intestinal begging in this case after, after food deprivation. So things were exacerbated after food deprivation, which is expected, of course. Okay. And then also we looked at the probability of obtaining food because then, of course, the, the nesting beg, but the, the parents are not passive actors in this uh, situation. They choose which nesting to feed. So they may also choose that they feed the other nesting which was not producing parents. They don't know which nesting was doing, was doing a parent as a bag. They, so they can, they, they, when they arrive in the nest, they may do some different choices which may cover one nesting or the other. So we looked at what was the probability of obtaining food by the food deprived or non food deprived nesting before food deprivation. So, of course, it's food deprived, but before food deprivation, which is control test. And there was no difference in the probability of obtaining food after performing uh, uh, pallet subset begging. Um, whereas in the after food deprivation trial, food deprived nesting were much more likely to obtain food than the non food deprived nesting after performing pallet subset begging. So, this. I can see you, Alessandro. You can see me. So I'm sharing again. Good. Yeah, now we learn how to do it. <laughs> yeah, you can see again everything. Let's skip back this thing. Yes, yes. here we go. Yeah. Apologies, apologies for this. Well, yeah. uh, it's my computer. We, we, we didn't lose them. So, um, as I said, uh, the, the, the lesser castle is colonial, so they breed in colonies, which nests may be close to each other. This is kind of colony, artificial colony, so we place nests in the roofs of artificial nests in roofs of buildings, but they can also do it naturally, so they naturally occur in colonies where the nests are very close one to another. Uh, this creates a, 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 an interesting situation where that whereas at some point when they grow, bird, the nestings can go out of the nest, because, especially because of the heat. This, this is my... Uh, Gonna be in Puglia, uh, so you can imagine in July, the nestings are almost ready to fledge. There is almost 50 degrees in this, this, between these this roofs, and uh, midday it can be very, very hot. The nesting get out of the nest to, to, to say, have some relief from, from, from heat. They may also die from overheating. This is something we're starting now, by the way. Uh, and anyway, 
um, they go out of the nest, and sometimes they kind of do mistakes. They go in other, in other nests, and they, they can this kind of nest swapping. And and what happens is that when they go in another nest, they may be adopted by the parents. Apparently, the parents are not able to recognize their own siblings, and they feed them as they were their own siblings. No problem. Uh, this has been demonstrated by uh, Teja in a Spanish colleague uh, studying uh, study in the past. And so there is no recognition of offspring by parents. Uh, but this creates, of course, a situation whereby nestlings have to compete to, to, uh, to uh, compete for food brought by parents with no siblings. So com they may be completely unrelated individuals, right? Of course, they are the same species, not like group parasites, but yeah, it's, it's completely unrelated to them. So uh, we try. We wanted to study whether there is a kind of different. Uh, the, 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 the nesting may behave differently when they have to compete with a sibling or with a non sibling. We took the opportunity of the Life Falcon project, which involved translocating a few individuals from the Matera colony to an experimental, uh, let's say, release tower in northern Italy, and then the population population, because the Life Falcon project involves, as Sarah knows well. <laughs> Involves the kind of uh, reinforcement of the northern Italian population of Lesser Castle, which has just been uh, uh, you know, settled in the past 20 years, but it's very small, very isolated. But it's very important for, climate, for let's say, buffering the effect of climate change because it's an expanding population. And so we have to kind of strengthen this population if we want the species to become resilient, more resilient to climate change. That's the idea of the project. Uh, this area in southern Italy, which now hosts thousands of Lesser Castles, may become unsuitable very soon, very in the coming years, because of uh, warming. Climate may become too warm, too dry in these areas, they will become, maybe become desert in a few, in a few not much, maybe. look at this year. And, 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 but these areas may remain suitable for, for a long time. So the idea is to strengthen this population, as it may allow also the species to move more readily in a heavily urbanized and anthropized, anthropized, anthropized landscape. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have to kind of help them to cope with climate change. That's the idea. So we build these towers, these uh, primillares, or nesting towers for the sequestrals. Uh, Spanish is primillar. And uh, um, where we kind of want to follow colonization by wild birth. They don't, I mean, they can accept bringing the nest boxes, but they are quite reluctant to go in a new setting. But you can follow this by releasing chicks uh, uh, in these towers, having led to naturally flesh there. And they will kind of recognize later and attract also other individuals. So the idea is to have a population which will settle thanks to our efforts uh, uh, next year in these towers. And we brought, uh, uh, we first demonstrated, of course, that they were genetically similar to the South American populations, that they were behaving the same way, let's say, during migration. So we did a lot of preliminary studies to show that this could be done without, let's say, doing disaster, because of course, if this birds, they would migrate and they would die all because they would be there. Wrong migration, let's say, from Italy uh, to, to the, they do migrate in Africa. So if they, if they do wrong migration, they could all die or even some of them. But we demonstrated that the migration patterns are very similar, they are genetically very related. So we expect that they will do well, even if it's translocated a thousand kilometers away from the breeding site. We don't know still because we are waiting for the first uh, results uh, this year, for the first arrival this year, or maybe more the next one. But uh, they fled successfully, so this net. So we brought this, this netlist from Matera to northern Italy. This is the translocation. Um, and so they were taken from the nest in Matera, two nestings per nest, we brought to, Matera, to northern Italy by car during a single night. We, we brought 30 nestings in uh, two, two per nest. But this creates an opportunity to study interaction, because once in the nesting tower, we could create, uh, let's say, we could maintain the same uh, Kinship relationships, but you can also do experiments by placing them in a double nest to different nesting or either siblings or no siblings. We had this opportunity because we had pairs of siblings starting from there. And so we did some experiments to check that they were interacting differently, uh, uh, whether they were siblings or no siblings. Uh, so uh, they were fed with mice, uh, is the, how they were in their new nests in, in uh, northern Italy. Nice, uh, as you see, nice deep nest, very well conceived. So the idea was to accept the, effect, the, the effects of key, but we kind of experimentally replicated what happens in natural groups when they mix. Okay. This was kind of, we kind of experimentally replicate this by having diets of nestlings, either 
two siblings or two non siblings, okay? where the level of kinship was very much modified. And again, if skin selection operates, we expect related inhibitors to compete less intensely for food or a, for a food item than our related ones. So now I have a few videos, very bad ones, but you can see. What the, oh, this is a, yeah, this is a two nestlings. As you see, there is a mice in between. They were left to interact. This is the, with the desk box with a video camera on it. They were left to interact uh, for one hour. Uh, and of course, in the morning. So there was the first feeding in the morning. So they were quite hungry because they were fed the, 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 the afternoon the day before, last time. And so in the end, we had uh, uh, from this, 15 diets of siblings, so 13 nestlings, we performed 15 trials, of course, of uh, siblings interaction, and then we mixed them and performed 27 trials with, uh, by, 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 with no siblings, so more, more trials uh, than, than, than for the sibling trials. Of course, we had more opportunities here to mix the different uh, instruments. This is a video showing how they do when they are the mice, a few examples. Well, you don't see, I mean, this is a quite fast video, but uh, faster, twice as fast as normally happens. You see they, they kind of you know, interact somehow. They, they, they... Nobody cares about the mouse. No, but it's, it's a dead one. Oh, it's, it's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> no, so nobody, nobody cares because it's frozen. Uh, there are some more, uh, yeah, now there should be some text here. I don't know why it doesn't show up anyway. Uh, so sometimes they kind of do weird things. Yeah. This video is not very good. But yeah. So this is food monopolization, as you can see here. So one of the of the nest things keeps the mouse under his legs and does not allow the sharing with the other one. So you see, it takes away the mouse, the mice, and he eats it. The other one. It's there, looking, waiting for his turn. And uh, the last thing which was the most interesting one in the end is this one, which I think is the food theft. Have a look at these two. This one is the mice. Want to look at the other one? The small one? Take the mice. This is a food theft, so stealing food. This can happen multiple times, right? So then the sibling within some time can go and steal the food and the mice from the other. So in, in, a, in a video of one hour, many of these things can happen. Right? We score all these behaviors, monopolization, uh, interactions, uh, uh, sharing, uh, and thefts, of course. And what is this? Oh, I don't know. Something else, I don't remember that. Because I don't know why there should be some text here, but some does not show up. It's a matter of, of let me see. What is this? By some other interactions. As you see, well, uh, for being raptors, they are not very aggressive. Even uh, as you see, they always, they sometimes they share. This is sharing. So they, they, they take the same piece of food together. They don't, sometimes they steal, but many times they also kind of uh, quite peacefully interact. So this is quite obvious in this case. So the main, the core results, with the, which was the only one, the only significant one, by the way, is that uh, the amount of food tests occurred more frequently in a, in a, in a feeding trial between unrelated individuals than between siblings. Okay? So again, this is an idea that, let's say, uh, a result which is entirely from uh, in line with the installation to, to, to operate in this, in this system. So uh, when, they, when they have siblings, the, 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 food, the, the food tests are called less frequent than when they are already. This is still unpublished, so we are probably we are still to, to see whether the reviewers will accept this result as significant or not, but let's see. And But yeah, the results are promising. And they are in line with what you expect from kin selection to operate in the system. So now, this and the last, the last example that I think I hope I can I could give you an overview of this topic and to which way that was some discussion of it. 
uh, is there uh, is there any question from yeah there is one question in the room yeah. and if uh, just a sec uh, if someone uh, from uh, online on youtube if you have any question please write it down write them down in the comment section of the youtube channel thanks please go on actually uh, two questions uh, I know that in nature uh, there are uh, some cases of uh, helping among birds in which a uh, uh, sibling of a certain generation uh, after migration uh, stay in the nest and uh, no, not, they, they go to the nest and help the bird nest. Yes, yeah. yeah. And they it's don't stay in the nest, they, they visit the nest. Ah, okay. Sorry for this. Because if you see this, you can share with the dog. Uh, okay. so, you just come there and visit and do something. Okay. In such cases, uh, could the uh, allo uh, queening and allo feeding uh, uh, behavior less frequent uh, uh, between uh, sibling uh, who belongs uh, who belong to the same uh, generation? Why would you expect so? Because uh, uh, one sibling relies less on uh, the help of uh, the sibling of the same generation and more on the help of the sibling of the last generation. Hmm. But are you aware that, let's say, allofreeding allo and allofreeding occur between the, the let's say, uh, sibling from previous generation uh, and the sibling of the same generation? Because normally what happens in those cases, I've seen, I, I know the cases of corvids. It's quite frequent in corvids, who are these helpers, right? I don't know what the systems, but maybe they're different. But the corvids are quite quite uh, interesting in this respect. Actually, uh, there, are, there are these helpers at the nests, especially in very dense uh, populations, and uh, which might be siblings, but they also may not be siblings. they kind of helpers, so they help the parents to raise the group. To some extent, uh, they don't do much. They just do some, let's say, anti-predator uh, alarming, and not much more. But they don't interact with the siblings. With let's, if they are, maybe they're not. So um, uh, I'm not sure the amount, the, the the extent of interactions, of physical interactions, let's say, between the visiting helper and the nestlings. Uh, well, is there a, is there actually an interaction? I, I'm not sure. Uh, there is a misunderstanding. I mean, uh, the difference uh, among uh, birds who have helpers and birds who have not have helpers. I mean, I mean, um, if a sibling that belong to the same generation uh, perform perform uh, more uh, allo screening. Uh, or uh, allo feeding if uh, it's present uh, or less uh, yeah. I, I perfectly understand what you mean. Uh -huh. But in, uh, for, for this to be the case, you would expect somehow the helper to interact with them. Otherwise, why would you expect that? If I mean, the helper doesn't do nothing, why they should allo bring or allo feed less? That's my question. So if, if the helper that arrives in the nest just looks and stays there, so why they should allo bring or allo feed less? I would expect this to be the case, so they do less for, for allopreening or feeding. If the helper does something, so for example, if there is if does some allopreening. But as, it, as I said, as far as I know, these helpers, they, well, they may be, I don't, I don't know in other systems, but there are many, you know, the birds are, are many species with many different uh, amounts of helping. So the system I know somehow of helping is that of, of crowds, and in crowds I know that uh, the helper doesn't do much. Just stays there, helps the parents to, to have a better breeding success. But basically, the helper is there just to ob obtain a territory as soon as one of the parents quits or dies. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, so it's just kind of a, a opportunistic behavior in those cases. But yeah, uh, it might be possible, I think, this, your, your idea is correct. But I, this, I would expect this to be the case if the helper interacts with the nestlings, which I don't think is often the case. Apart from maybe some feeding. Okay. Thank you, Yeah. 
As far as I, I, can, I, can I tell you a bit more about Corbis? There is the, the study by Vittorio Baglione and Daniela Canestrari, and they showed that at some point that the helpers, the Corbis helpers, they were bringing food to, to chicks, so they were kind of apparently bringing food to chicks, but they found, they said, by looking more in details at videos, they said that they were doing more, in most cases, this, this feeding of chicks was a false feeding. So they were putting the, the, the food in the mouth of the chicks and they did that. So that's what the actors were doing. <laughs> so they're kind of showing up to the parents, the, the, the territorial parents, that they were helping, but they were not. They were faking it. Yeah. I mean, of course, they, maybe they were doing some anti predator behavior. This is important, especially in crowds, to have somebody who checks around the nest because there is a lot of nest predation. So having more birds wandering around helps the, the brood to, to, to fledge because may the predator more more effectively but for feeding for interacting with youngs you know it's kind of <laughs> tricky and the second one yeah. uh, it's about uh, the insecticide in uh, the routes uh, in birds uh, and you say that uh, apparently it has no reason and no no is, what, what they said is that it might have reasons but uh, uh yeah what go on sorry yeah. yes um, but uh, my question is about uh, mechanistic because uh, 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 could uh, a reason of such behavior a delay in a in this vision center development in the nervous system? Because uh, I I do such question because I read uh, something uh, really similar in um, a paper, but not about birds, about cuttlefish. And um, newborn cuttlefish uh, don't perform any, no, uh, tend to perform uh, some behavior without control, also aggressive behavior, because they don't uh, uh, develop a mission center. That is very interesting. That is very interesting. I, well, I don't know much about the proximate mechanisms. I don't think nobody knows because I don't think it's easy to do so some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, 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 anatomical or you know, what, what can, can be done there. It should be some kind of, uh, the ones, the test which uh, uh, teaches maybe. Yeah. With uh, captive birds, <laughs> you can do captive birds. Yeah, we can keep eagles in captivity, but you sacrifice. You should you need to sacrifice nesting to look at brain development. So this is nothing to do with the uh, actor, which is not my good the species. So, <laughs> but yes, it can be possible. Yeah, but really, I don't. I don't think there is almost nothing known about the proximate mechanisms leading to. Uh, what I can tell you is that the ultimate mechanism. So uh, uh, is that yeah, probably. But this this is something. This is a kind of competition which. Uh, in species which have, let's say, a very, a very strong uh, uh, competition for nesting sites, starts already in the uh, chase, that's what they were saying. But from a proximal perspective, yes, there are many possibilities that may fail with this. Okay. It may just, well, it may also be just that our hormones, which are different, I think, so they kind of address, let's say, I would expect we have to have, they have more testosterone. You know whether this point, then uh, they are anatomical effects on the development of. of Centers control the pressure. Okay. okay, I have a question from someone online. Awesome. Yes, yeah. yes, we will just to do one. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, it's an interesting question on uh, by Luca Marinoni that is asking for barn swallows. Wouldn't the modulation of competition based on PAB end up positively selecting lying chicks, so the liars? Uh, who beg when parents are, are absent, regardless of their feeding situation. Of course, this isn't are open to. Uh, this isn't maybe open to ch cheating, of course. But uh, yes, but uh, this should be controlled for because uh, when one cheats, then the signal is no longer honest. And we demonstrate that it is honest. So they do it when they because of course it's a signal which is costly also for them. To perform parents up something. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the energetic cost of begging which controls the situation and avoids cheating. And of mm -hmm. course, then it wouldn't work if it was like this. Of course, it, it is a, it's a system which may be open to cheating, but apparently it doesn't happen. Okay, so. doesn't. okay thanks. And uh, from uh, the... I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, I mean, 
Okay, I was wondering if there can be trace a correlation between, I mean, it's somewhat similar to the question that Doug made. I mean, I know that there are some species, like for example, wild turkeys, where siblings um, cooperate during reproduction, helping the main reproductive individual to get um, a leg, if I recall correctly. I, I really don't know much about birds, so. But I was wondering if there can be traced a correlation between uh, cooperation in the brood and then cooperation in later stages in life. That Difficult to say. Uh, what I can tell you is that my idea is not. It will not. This is not the case. Uh, I, well, thinking of the system where where, where cooper, kind of cooperation has been shown, like the banals, I mean, there is the adults, they are territorial and they do not interact. So then there are no helpers in the nest, for example. The banals are just breeding pair. That's it. Nobody, no, no external individuals interact with the production in banals. But about the, the cooperation in banals, how much play is the Division of other breeding and food sharing. But does it happen straight ahead or maybe it's delayed by two hours, maybe even the day after? No, the, the, all the, the, the interactions I've been showing were happening the same night. So I think you can consider, uh, and uh, you know, my hours are nocturnal, so they are active from dusk to dawn, and uh, during the day they sleep, even the chicks they do. Too. And um, so all the interactions I was showing were, were on a single night, per night basis. So I don't know exactly when this was the case, but you know they have one feeding in the evening and one feeding in the morning. So there is not much. It did all this, this interaction occur during the night between one of the feeding and the other. Uh, and the last one is just a curiosity about the egret pushing the sibling out of the nest. But the picture that you showed, it, it really looked different from the they go killing his sibling because I mean that looked really dangerous even for the one that was doing the pushing and the one I showed. Yeah, I mean he was almost out of the nest as well. And they are I can tell you that they are highly <laughs> I would say right. Yeah they they they, they don't, they don't fall over there. It, they can only fall if they're pushed out of the nest. If you have ever seen a, a, a one of those chicks climbing on trees, it's crazy. You don't, you can't catch them by hand. I've been trying, but I've been, it happened to me to be within a, a, a heron ring. Uh, well, these chicks falling down from, from all over the nest because when, as soon as you get in, they get panicked and they, some thoughts that they fall down. But as soon as they fall down, the healthy ones, they immediately uh, climb back to their nest and they are so fast that you can't, you can't, have, you can't catch them. You can't grab them. They're terribly fast. So the ones which are uh, like this, the, the, the junior one, which was pushed down from the nest, could also climb back very fast, but then the other one was there, you know, stabbing him, right? So, so uh, the point is that that was active displacement from the nest. Otherwise, the chick, the chick would, could easily come back if left alone, very fast, but the other one was stabbing back. And so, in the end, it was falling down. Yeah. When you are on the ground, then you sleep more, and then you are also maybe some wounds, wounds because you know, these, these pills are horrible. It, 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 it's, you know, if you ring, you've ever been in a bird ringing station and capturing, let's say, a little bittern, which is a small heron, it's a high risk that they, 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 they point at your eyes and they make you blind. So it's good that we, as bird ringers, have glasses because it has happened to me to have a pill of, of a little bit like this. And, you know, it's not nice. So, yeah, uh, they tend to climb back unless they are pushed down again by the other But that was not risky for, for the one remaining one. Yeah. You. It's just, uh, you know, kind of, uh, if you don't know birds, it may seem risky, but it's not. They are very small. You know, the heron nests are not nests because they are kind of a few sticks on the, on the middle of a branching tree. So the birds, they are not really staying into the nest. They're just staying on it, hanging on the branches. So. It's really, they're very used to stay very, uh, holding very tight branches and don't fall down unless they are pushed down. Okay, Diego, I think we 
we are done with the with the main seminar now uh, and there's no more questions at the moment from uh, online there's, is there any other question from the I yeah have one more yeah. How would they know they are siblings? Yeah. <laughs> that's not a very basic question, that's a key question actually. Uh, the question is also whether they can recognize, let's say, familia from nestings, from, which for, for sure they will, from let's say, not well, of course not, it's a possibility, but what I'm saying, for example, one, one of the limitations of the study of Rolas Kestos is that we let compete together familiar things, that is to say the same things. Familiar by being that they know each other, okay, because they've been grown together. And whereas if, when we put a sibling with a non-sibling, they never see each other. So they are they are not only non-siblings, but they are also non-familiar. So they didn't know each other. So the question is, is it an effect of kinship or Familiarity. The two things are, you know, kind of different, right? Well, in this case, they, they match because it's exactly what happens in nature. So at some point, one nesting pops up in a, in a nest of another bird and it's adopted by parents. So it's both non kin and non familiar. And this is what the situation we kind of mimic, right? But it would be very interesting to uh, check whether they kind of recognize uh, kinship. Actually, rather than familiarity. Speaking but this, this, this requires a very different experimental setup, whereby, for example, you merge chicks at a very young age, let's say soon after hatching, you create a brood of. Uh, but this, of course, is not easy to do. At least not with it. We did it with Bans Palos, but this was not a study I showed you. Uh, it was another study by Giuseppe Concoraglio, who then uh, did a study where they swapped. I think they swapped, if I'm not uh, wrong, they swapped uh, eggs and they let chicks grow into uh, those uh, nests. Uh, so they, from, from the start, they had uh, clutches composed of siblings, which were siblings, of course, but they were also clutches with, with no siblings, but they were familiar because when they were tested, they'd be hatching together and growing together. And in those cases, the intensity of begging of the non-familiar clutches, clutches with non-familiar, with the uh, uh, familiar but non-kin nestlings, well, the intensity was higher than in clutches with all nestlings, uh, control clutches. So I can tell you that there is a possibility that they can detect kinship in some how, somehow with the know, which is the cue they use. They may use uh, self smell, they may use uh, behavior. They may use vocalizations, they may use uh, you know, aspects because they look all similar to us, but maybe to them they may look each other very different. So, this is something which is a, a key question, but nobody, I think there is no answer. But for sure, they can detect both familiarity and kinship somehow. Uh, there's, um, I would say, one last question actually from Ricardo Farinella online from yeah. YouTube. And he's uh, um, he's a, a geneticist, so he's not an ecologist or an ecologist. Yeah. So he's he's apologizing in advance because he, he doesn't know whether he's no word. okay. So uh, according to you, which one between social and sexual selection can play a major role in determining cooperation and social inter? Sexual selection and cooperation. I don't know. Well, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, of course. If you think of lions, lion packs, 
you have strong circulation and cooperation between teammates at least. What's the story among birds uh, when I know a species of uh, paradise birds uh, in which uh, uh, some males uh, help uh, one other males to meet. Uh, yeah, men are kids. They perform uh, a, a kind of uh, dance together. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, I have to stop here because uh, your line, yeah, but don't worry now. I would say that we uh, we wrap it up now. Um, and uh, of course, I want to thank you, Diego, for, for your seminar beside these uh, technical issues that are not depending on, oh. I don't think it's a matter of my computer because it says at some point. It's don't know what to say, so anyhow. So uh, thanks a lot, and for those that are on uh, uh, on YouTube, I, I remind you of the next seminar that will be on the 11th of April with Lisa Locatello, and she will be talking about sexual selection mm -hmm. and the ascent of females, lessons on mate choice and from benthic fishes. I think it will be another very interesting uh, seminar. So uh, Diego. Thanks really a lot for, for your presentation and, uh, and uh, we are happy to have you here.